What's up YouTube, I'm Mike and today I'm back with a, a little bit of a storytelling video. Uh, I was doing research uh, last night on human growth hormone because I've made several videos now uh, going into the study about how to uh, get more height out of uh, adolescent boys using growth hormone which led to the pediatrics uh, uh, article that I, I talked about yesterday uh, that dug a little bit deeper into the ethical uh, dilemma that scientists have faced with uh, prescribing things like growth hormone and trying to dodge uh, whether, where, whether or not they were actually practicing medicine or whether they were engaged in behavior that was considered uh, enhancement of a, of a person's height above and beyond baseline, which to me, I mean, just is it, completely insane that this would even be a concern. I don't know why, uh, I can't for the life of me understand why medical science would just completely close themselves off to actually improving the condition of the human animal. I don't know why they only get involved when there's a problem that requires treatment. It seems to me there should be an entire branch of science, there probably is somewhere, that's focused purely on making the human body better. How can we make ourselves taller, faster, have better vision? Why are these things not being studied? Why is it that enhancement is not an entire um, branch of medical science in and of itself to try to maximize the potential of the human animal? Uh, growing up, they used to tell us all the time that, that, that most humans only use 10% of their brain. I don't know if this is actually true, if that's just another bro science thing that people parrot. But if there's any truth to that at all, you would think that scientists would be uh, bending over backwards to figure out how to tap into more brain matter. Uh, but nevertheless, in, in the process of doing this research on human growth hormone, I came across some, some basically some history lessons about how growth how we got the growth hormone that we have today. So I found it interesting, and I decided to paraphrase it into a video uh, that maybe you guys will enjoy while you're doing whatever you do when you watch my videos. So um, this data is available to anybody. I just chose to be to be the storyteller today. So what I found out is that human growth hormone was discovered, uh, it's been known to scientists since the 1920s, but it, they didn't actually start using it for, for any of the purposes that we think of today. For example, trying to treat children uh, of short stature it, uh, or other pituitary disorders until 1963. Part of the reason for this is because uh, growth hormone was very, very hard to come by. So it turns out that before they figured out how to create recombinant human growth hormone, which we'll get to in a second, the only methodology for, 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 getting to, for getting growth hormone, human growth hormone, was to extract it from the pituitary gland, which apparently is this like pea-sized gland that's like way like in the center of your brain, down, down the bottom, like in the middle. And obviously you can't access this on a living human. So they were they were taking, they were extracting the um, the pituitary gland from cadavers. And then there was a process that they used to extract the human growth hormone. So basically the short side of it is, and there's actually a life, a life magazine article in, in October 11th, 1948, Life magazine published uh, this series of pictures. I'll link I'll link this in the description and it explains the effects of, of growth hormone and, and how they extract it. So they would, they would get a bunch of cadavers and they would extract their pituitary glands and then they basically just have a dish with a whole bunch of pituitary glands and dry ice and they would put that into like a blender. Uh, it would grind together the glands and the dry ice to produce a mixture whose temperature remains below freezing during the pulverizing process. Eventually the hormone emerges in crystal form. So they would pulverize a bunch of cadaver pituitary glands alongside dry ice and that would render growth hormone crystals. It says that from 100 grams of glands, they were only able to extract 0.3 grams of fully of, of fluffy crystals, and this was this was done at Yale University. Uh, so it says, but this is about 50 times the yield that would have been resulted from the old processing technique. So this was this was cutting edge in 1948. This was. 
This was the new way to do it. So they would pulverize cadaver pituitary glands and 100 grams of glands would get them 0.3 grams of actual human growth hormone crystals. Uh, so obviously uh, this was problematic. Well, what was even more problematic is that it turns out that, that, that while they were doing this to, to, get the, uh, to get the growth hormone, they didn't, I guess, think or, or didn't know. I don't know the, the circumstances, but there's a disease uh, called Crutz, Crutz, Crutzfeld, Crutzfeld Jacob disease. Uh, this is uh, similar to mad cow disease. And basically, some of the, 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 the some of the growth hormone <laughs> that was that was extract. I shouldn't be laughing. This is horrific, but it's just it's just to me it's mind blowing how far we've come scientifically. So if if you happen to be on growth hormone today, I'm going to warn you. This is a little bit terrifying, but rest assured, your growth hormone was not made this way. So, uh, but in the past, you could have unfortunately been one of these people. So some of the growth hormone that was extracted from the, from the cadaver pituitary glands was infected. It was contaminated with Creutzfeldt Jacob disease, uh, which is uh, Creutz, it's a CJD for short. It says is similar in effects to mad cow disease or accelerated Alzheimer's, causing rapid brain degeneration leading to death within a year of the first symptoms. There is no treatment and no test for CJD. Here's the catch though. So once you become symptomatic, you will have very advanced brain degeneration and you will be dead in a year. The unfortunate thing is that you can be infected with CJD and it can lie dormant inside of your brain after exposure for decades, decades. So eventually what happened is that 26 people ended up dying from Creutzfeldt Jacob disease that they, that they contracted from contaminated HGH. But because there was no way to test for the disease, anyone who received human growth hormone in the 60s and 70s was notified that at any given time over the next, depending on how long it had been, it, it could take decades for them to become symptomatic. So imagine what it would be like if you had taken your kid or if you were the kid who went and got human growth hormone trying to fix your height problem and then the doctor comes along and says, look, there's a chance that you might have been infected with human mad cow disease but we're not going to know for 20 to 30 years possibly and we, so we have no way to test for it and if you develop these symptoms then you're going to be dead in a year. <laughs> like, oh. Can you imagine going to bed and like every time I would be a total basket case. There's no way I would make it. Every single day I would be convinced that I had a symptom and that, that was, that, that was going to spell the end. Which what a horrible way to die. So it says eventually 26 people would die from CJD, from contaminated human growth hormone. The fact that there was no way to test for the infection turned the lives of all of those who had been treated in the 60s and 70s into a terrifying waiting game. Patients lived in constant fear of, of the onset of symptoms. This uncertainty resulted in another strange story where a man who had received human growth hormone as a child pled innocent to charges of taking out his own mother, uh, who was named Susan Cabot, she was a B-film actress, uh, claiming that he was suffering from the effects of uh, Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. So God knows how many people there were walking around in, you know, in the late 70s, early 80s, who basically every, every day they were going to bed, they were, facing, they were facing up with the fact that they could tomorrow wake up with, with symptoms of this horrific disease that was going to make them go completely nuts and kill them within a year. So following, once they figured out that this was going on, uh, obviously they, they shut it down. So following the discovery of the contamination in 1985, <laughs> the U.S. Food and Drug Administration halted all distribution of cadaver-derived HGH. And then guess what? So... Here comes the conspiracy theory, right? 
So for those of us who have been who have been doing business with a company called QSC, also known as King Dao Sigma Chemicals, uh, they operate out of China, and there have been some rumors uh, on some forums and some Discord pages that their business might be in jeopardy. The reason their business might be in jeopardy is because a company named Eli Lilly, you may have heard of them, recently went to China looking to expand their pharmaceutical operations. The word on the street is that one of the conditions of opening multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical grade laboratories in China would be that China do something about their underground uh, drug uh, sources. So you've got, for example, a company like QSC who is producing large quantities of human growth hormone. And guess who? Take a wild guess who the company is that developed the recombinant HGH that we all use today. Eli Lilly. It says here, following the, the discovery of the contamination, oh, excuse me, I already said that. So, they halted all distribution of the cadaver-sourced HGH. But as luck would have it, a new source of AGA HGH was in the hopper. Biotechnology company Genentech and drug company Eli Lilly had both independently been working on a new way to manufacture HGH using recombinant bacteria. So this is how our HGH is made today. This is the layman's version that won't bore you to death. Basically what they do is they figure out how to get bacteria and yeast to synthesize the HGH for them. That's what scientists did. So they've used clone DNA and messenger RNA, which they put into the cell of the bacteria or the yeast, and it produces large volumes of recombinant human growth hormone. What the fuck is that beeping sound? It's my chicken. Jesus. So we've got recombinant human growth hormone that is being produced by bacteria and yeast at a substantially greater rate than what than anything close to what they were able to get out of the cadavers with no risk of contamination, hopefully. And so basically overnight, HGH just becomes, it, it, there, there's just all of a sudden there's a surplus of it because it's so easy to make. So coincidentally, while companies like QSC are selling human growth hormone in 10 uh, packs of, so you can get 10 vials of 10 IUs per vial for around 60 bucks from a company like King Dow Sigma Chemicals. If you try to buy a pharma grade HGH, you're, you're into the thousands, I think. So we've got orders of magnitude, cheaper product being produced in China and it's destroying the American the American market for it because for years, word on the street also was that the Chinese HGH wasn't any good. That you really needed the pharma grade somatropin or whatever it's called and that was the only way to get the full effects. Well, now it's been well, well and truly proven that that's complete crap and the HGH that is made in China is every bit as good as what you can get for orders of magnitude more money in America and so it's, it's hammering their business. Another thing that's happening right now that's suspiciously connected to China is you may have seen in the, the news recently that uh, they're going after the drug, the drug companies in, the, in America because of the very high prices of Ozempic. And there's another drug, I forget what it is, uh, Wagovi maybe, I can't remember what, it's, what it is. I'm probably mixing up an age drug there because for some reason Hulu just tries to just browbeat me to death with, with prep drugs and age drugs. But anyway, Ozempic is one of them that is extremely expensive to purchase in America. Meanwhile, if you happen to use uh, a Chinese-based business, you can get it for pennies on the dollar. And this is causing massive waves in the American drug industry and so coincidentally, Eli Lilly makes a little trip over to China and is trying to woo them. Uh, again, this is, this is just rumor on the street. I don't know that this is true or not, but word on the street is that they're trying to woo China into closing down uh, all of their underground laboratories that are producing drugs like, or that are producing human growth hormone and things like Ozempic 
to again take possession of the market. Obviously, you can't sell these things, you know, uh, for a thousand dollars if you can get them for literally pennies on the dollar somewhere else. And they clearly have no way of stopping it. Apparently, customs is is just definitively not shutting this down. So I just found that this was interesting uh, story. Uh, that luckily, again, we have the luxury of living in the in the new age where we have ready access from countless businesses who are producing recombinant HGH and we can use it for all of the purposes that we now know through what limited amounts of research are out there uh, HGH is good for and, and there's I'm not going to go into all of the things that you can use it for there's countless things that it is very very good at that it is very it is uh, good at doing I guess and so I just thought it was interesting when I read the story uh, of how horrific uh, the history of, of this compound, amino acid chain, whatever you want to call it, drug, I guess, uh, actually is because, um, I mean, damn, imagine what it must have been like to be one of those people who got the very bad news that uh, they could at any moment develop symptoms of a horrific disease that would... Uh, they would kill them once once they once they found out they had it and there was nothing to be done about it. So I don't want to fear monger, okay? I, I'm not saying, but I'm just saying when you pay, this is why I don't like jumping on the bandwagon of anything new. You know, SARMs come out and everybody starts screaming about how safe they are or they're better than anabolics and people are like, hey Mike, why don't you take SARMs? Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? And I'm like, eh. I don't know, bro. It's kind of new. Even if it's 20, 30 years, like I would much rather take my chances with DECA, Test, Trend, stuff that's been a, stuff that's been around for 50 plus years and hasn't turned anybody into a mad cow than to roll the dice with some SARM that maybe or maybe isn't better than the tried and true and the tried and true anabolics that we've had for almost a century. And there's not enough. There's not been enough time and there's not enough use cases to know what is going to happen. Do I think anything this horrific is going to happen? No. But I, I personally take a lot of uh, comfort in seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger walking around having had used the same anabolics that I'm using. That's very comforting to me, seeing this man at 70 plus years old, very healthy, Lou Ferrigno, Dorian Yates, there's lots of old bodybuilders walking around who were using the compounds that I use. It, you know, maybe SARMs are the next best thing or, or whatever, you know, there's all, Ozempic, this is another thing. Like, everybody seems to think that Ozempic is safe. Hopefully it is. The problem is, is that when something gets proven to be unsafe, it's not until it Fs up a lot of people. You know, like it's always way down the line, could be 10 years down the line before they start getting enough use cases and enough people wandering into ERs with some strange condition before they start to put the pieces together that, oh my God, there's a, there's a, a commonality here. All of these people use Ozempic. Again, I'm not trying to fear monger. I'm just trying to express why it is that I'm a slow adopter. I, I'm not quick to just jump on a bandwagon because I, I I'm happy guinea pigging, you know, like what happens if you if you combine three nineteen nors. This is another thing like mint. That was, I didn't want to I didn't want to mess with mint. It's too new, and look what happened. It was a total disaster in my body. I feel so much better at, on every measurable metric uh, now that I'm off that mint than I did when I was on it. Is that definitively mint's fault? No, again, there's too many, there's too many variables here. But I prefer to guinea pig myself with, you know, what happens when we use various combinations or various doses of tried and true anabolics. Not let me be the first uh, person on the new rocket. Like, I'm not going to live in the first Mars colony. You guys got to go quality test that. You know, some people are going to have to not make it. You got like you, you never buy the first generation of anything, anything. 
You never, ever, ever buy the first generation of anything. I just bought a brand new BMW M240i today. I picked it up. It's got a B58 engine in it. This is a tried and true, amazing, amazing engine that there is a lot, there are, there, there are millions of them on the road. That's what I want. I don't want, even BMW, I don't want BMW's brand new engine. Y'all got to work the kinks out on that. One of the things that, that ended up being true, even of the B58, is that it had some oil uh, cooler problems. I think it's oil cooler uh, or water pump. Or some, there was some pump or something on the B58 engine that had, a, I guess, a plastic part in it uh, that they used plastic trying to, I think, cut down on weight, and they were failing way too soon and the, the cost of the repair was very high. It was a couple thousand dollars, I think, to, to, to repair whatever this part was in the B58 engine. Thankfully, they sorted that out before I took delivery of my car. That's just an, another example of why you do not want the early generation of anything. I don't care how well it was engineered, shit happens. Things go wrong. You, you, can't, you cannot uh, foresee every possible outcome and it's always best to let somebody else work the kinks out first. I think that's what I just did with Mint. And uh, my estimation is don't take it. Don't take it at all. Uh, but that's just me. And I may be different uh, as I continuously prove that I am. So there you have it. Uh, I just thought that I would share that terrifying, horrible, miser miserable story so that we can all appreciate the time that we are living in. Thankfully, we are living in a time period where we, have, we really do have amazing access to a lot of things that allow us to effectively biohack our bodies, which is what this is. And I really uh, would love to see medical science embrace this because it undeniably is the wave of the future. Undeniably, the next step in human evolution is overcoming all of our weaknesses. Evolution is slow. Science is much faster. The, the chances of science developing better eyeballs, better sensory organs, extending life by, by controlling cell apoptosis. There's, there's a lot of things that, that medical science could accomplish in a very short period of time rather than waiting around and hoping uh, that one of these things gets selected for uh, through the very, very tedious process of evolution, which apparently half my audience doesn't even believe it. So anyway, there you have it. Um, enjoy your HGH if you happen to be getting it. And if you're not getting it, uh, again, don't break the law of your country. This is not medical advice. But we may be, may, we may be, um, in, in the end of days, as, it, as far as it comes to having access to uh, pharmaceuticals that are extraordinarily cheap. Right now, we have a veritable catalog of, of drugs and, 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 um, and pharmaceuticals and peptides and all kinds of things that uh, anyone with, with such a uh, desire can get access to and the party may be coming to an end. We will just see what happens over the next, the course of the next days, months, and maybe years. As much as I love and will absolutely vote for Donald Trump and want his establishment to take power in this country, um, that might not be good for the, the underground lab scenario in this world. Uh, it is highly likely that those businesses are not going to flourish under a Trump regime. So um, if you're already invested, it might be time to stock up, boys. I don't know. We'll see what happens. As always, thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next one.